Look at that. Did it. Amazing. Okay. So <laughs> I'm here with Curtis Childs. He's the uh, he's from the Swedenborg Foundation, uh, and he's got a channel called Off the Left Eye, which is um, a channel which explores the life and teachings of Emanuel Swedenborg, who I've actually spoken about quite a few times on this channel, like previously, many years ago. Um, and I, you probably know this, I'll just give you a little introduction to this. Like my, uh, I started my channel after doing like ayahuasca for a couple of years. And then I had this like big spiritual awakening um, where I also started seeing spirits and this kind of thing. And, um, and the funny thing about it is like, just before that happened, I was in an ayahuasca ceremony and I was given this message to contact an old friend from high school. And we weren't really close friends. We like wrestled in the wrestling team. This is up in Maine in okay. the States. And um, so I'm like, that's weird. Okay, so I got in touch with him. I found him on Facebook and I was like, hey, dude, uh, this is going to sound really crazy, but blah, blah, yeah. blah. And he's like, well, he's like, uh, I said, I had the spiritual awakening and like I was told to contact you. He's like, oh, he's like, I, I've heard about this stuff a lot. He's like, I'm actually a, a pastor, or a priest for the Swedenborg church. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, what, what, who is Swedenborg, right? And I'm like, that yeah. is really strange. So I went through a little period there of like trying to read some of the Swedenborg stuff, like Heaven and Hell, some of these books. He's, as you'll get into, he's a prolific author. Um, and uh, it didn't really go much further than that. He was he was a, a military priest. And like, maybe there was something like maybe to try and help deal with like the trauma and the PS, PTSD, like a lot of like uh, ex-vets do like psychedelics these days to, to clean yeah. their minds out or whatever but that was kind of this that was my first introduction and i found your channel before too and man i love your channel and the main thing about it is this um what's cool about your channel dude is that dude you guys just have a great attitude you just get a really <laughs> good attitude man i love your attitude and I think, I'm not sure about this, you know, I've kind of like, in my little spiritual journey, I've kind of sort of gone down the tantric Buddhist path, I guess. But, you know, there's something about the Christian uh, sensibility, which I think can maybe be refined down to like friendship and fellowship, which is such a simple concept. Yeah, right. right. But you seem to exemplify this, I think, like you really, because you're like really open minded and like, you are willing to sort of look at what well, did you're, you're talking to me, dude. That's pretty open minded, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I, I think it's really cool. It's really cool, and I and it's um, I think your channel is really awesome for that because it's open, and yet it's got a Christian because Swedenborg's interesting, right? Because he's got a sort of he's yeah he's Christian, but he's a mystic. Can you tell it's us hard. something about who he was or what what's that about? Yeah. It's hard to categorize Swedenborg because, yes, he's certainly a Christian mystic is a great thing to call him. I think if there was a test about Swedenborg and you put that, I could give you an A for that. But on the other hand, there was a guy named D.T. Suzuki, who was a big figure in Zen Buddhism and its introduction to the West. And he wrote a book about Swedenborg that was called Buddha of the North. And it was focusing on the similarities between the underlying deep themes of what Swedenborg wrote and then Buddhist philosophy. And you have Swedenborg talking about, sure, Christian sounding stuff, talks about the Bible, talks about heaven, Jesus. But then he is also recounting all these really out there, out of body experiences and spiritual experiences and talking of people who have been dead for centuries and having clairvoyant episodes so i think it's tough to to put him in a box i think he speaks in christian language but what he speaks about is a really broad universal thing i mean he was saying back in the 1700s when he was doing this he was saying like heaven and hell are states of mind you don't have to be of any particular religion to go to heaven these were the sorts of things that I oh, mean, he got put on trial for it. It was the religion was the state at the time. So you couldn't say what he was saying. Now it sounds doesn't sound out of place, but in 1700s it was it was so, newsworthy that that he was saying all this stuff. So I think Swedenborg is fascinating because he's a really thorough 
documentation of this spiritual side of life. This is a guy who was having reporting, having spiritual experiences, but lucid ones and, and on command for decades in a row, three decades in a row. And given that he was already highly trained in a number of fields of study, right? He was a leading anatomist, inventor, mining engineer. Uh, he was in the Swedish House of Nobles. He was smart and well-trained. So he was able to record this stuff with a lot of precision and organization. It doesn't mean it doesn't get philosophical and hard to not get bored by at times, but it's really valuable, I think, to anybody who's interested in anything that goes beyond what's physical, because I think he can give you structure for that. For example, I was watching an interview that you did, and you talked about you saw a demon that was like Angelina Jolie in yeah. Maleficent. Yeah. I sure. sound, sounds a lot like what Swedenborg describes as sirens. So to Swedenborg, angels and demons are all used to be people. So you have your, your life here and you're a human being. And throughout our lives, we are forming our spirits based on what we love and intend. So what we do intentionally because we enjoy it. And so the more that you do things that are constructive and beneficial, because you enjoy them, the more you're forming your spirit into what you could call being an angel. And the more you're devoting yourself towards things that feel good, but are harmful to other people, or the, like the joy of dominating and controlling and manipulating other people, the more you form your spirit into what Swedenborg calls a demon or a Satan or something like that. And there's this one group of people that he calls sirens. And he says that that was people who were really and they can be male or female but he talks about encounters with a lot of female ones and it's people who would um figure out essentially were, were very superficial and would figure out what other people were into what made them tick and try to manipulate them using that and so in the in the other life they he says that they can appear attractive but are really malicious and try and he has these like whole series of encounters with this one that was constantly trying to drag him down and, and destroy his soul. So it just, when you said that, I was like, well, oh, that sounds exactly like how Swedenborg describes it. Yeah. Well, one of the things I like about, what well, or one of the things about um, what you just said there, he was saying that, you know, like, um, it's about what you choose, like it's about what you, what you love. And like, I yeah. think he was saying that too, like when he was talking about where you go into heaven or hell, it's actually, this is one of the phrases that really caught me when I read it back, back in the day was that, um, he says in one of his books that people aren't cast into hell. They dive into their personal, it's like their, their biggest desire. So it's not like they're right. being like cast into it. They see it and it's like, oh my, this is awesome. And in a way, you know, it's interesting because like we tend, to, I mean, the mechanics of consciousness, like it's easy to get super complicated about it and think that, oh, wow, consciousness is so complex. But like on a fundamental level, it's literally about a choice in this moment about what you love. It's actually not right. that complex. I mean, I was talking to this, this lady, Tara Springett, who's a, a tantric Buddhist teacher recently in an interview. She's got this whole thing. I guess it's the, the, the Zochen path is like, you just choose joyfulness. It's just a choice. You just make it. And what's really funny is like in your daily life, tr actually trying to choose to be joyful. And when, when I was talking about fellowship and all this stuff about how just being like Christians are so friendly, there's this idea. It's literally just choosing to be that way. Like it's, it's almost, it sort of starts from this like desire or a choice to, to, to be nice or you know, it's such a simple thing. Yeah. And you can get tied up with these complex mechanics. And that's almost like, um, I mean, I think you've talked about this in some of your interviews, like there's the, um, like the the evil spirits or whatever, they're, they're, they they throw in these they throw in these little these little uh, wrenches into the into the simple machinery of consciousness, where you start exploring this sort of spaghetti possibilities of what might be truth, but actually isn't, yes. and it's deceptive. Do you think it's deceptive? Yeah. So people. You look at, look at people and they're people try to take advantage of other people. I mean, when, when my phone rings 90% of the time, I don't answer it because it's some unknown number. And I just know 
there's somebody there who's trying to get me to pick up and that'll enter my name into some database or, or they'll try to sell me car insurance I don't need or, or whatever, because people are just trying to find out where, and, and they're really not targeting me. They're targeting maybe somebody who's a little bit older and, is, and doesn't quite know to look out for that. But people always do that. And Swedenborg says, yeah, pe people die, consciousness survives. So people who have made a habit of doing that and enjoying it and making it their life they continue to act that way in, in spirit. And so when you get to be a spirit, either a spirit who's choosing what's good and true or who's choosing what's evil and false, you get really hyper-focused on whatever it is you love the most. So people who love to control and manipulate and everything will really find ways to do it. And Swedenborg was shocked to see how much the positive and negative side of the spiritual world is around us all the time and influencing us. So he would get to the point where he described having what he calls perception, which perception is just a state you can get in where you can tell when something occurs to you, if it's true or false, and where it came from spiritually. He says that everything has a source, everything conscious has a source in the spiritual world. You could call it the consciousness world because it's all based around consciousness there. And the conscious part of us is a spirit, according to Swedenborg. So he would get to the point where when something false or that would trip you up, like you're saying, came into his mind, he could kind of look at the tag and see wh where did this come from? He could find actually the influence in the spiritual world that put that in his head and detach himself from it. So that's actually been really helpful to me in I've had a lot of struggles with anxiety and depression and obsessive compulsive disorder. And until I really got those Swedenborg concepts, I was just baffled by why my own mind seemed so aggressive against my happiness. Yeah. It didn't make any sense. Like it was, it was constantly coming up with strategies and ways to get me to continue to worry about stuff or be miserable. Yeah. And it just, it just didn't add up. And I, I didn't have any means by which to say, Hey, I'm going to set a boundary and not listen to those thoughts because I think yeah. they're mine. They're just, they're just mine. It's just mine. So coming across his description of consciousness and how we can be influenced by good and bad things through it, that gave me the leverage to say, well, this idea is here, but it's just like my phone. When I see that it's an, an unknown number, I don't pick it up, which is just like, if I get this negative idea, I know like, I don't need to worry about that. That's, that's just coming, coming out of some kind of source of falsity. Quick question. I mean, you're really knowledgeable as Swedenborg. I mean, I watch your interviews and you're like really fluent in the ideas and the books and the whole thing. Like why, what brought you down this path where you started becoming interested in Swedenborg yourself? Well, I've, uh, my parents read Swedenborg. I, the yeah, church yeah. that I went to when I was younger was had a Swedenborg based church. So this has been, around for me but i think when i was a kid i don't think i was that into it and uh you don't really necessarily grab onto your cultural surroundings but when i was probably 17 or 18 and i started to have my first big bout of depression anxiety a few years into that i discovered i, I really for myself started to read and understand swedenborg's teachings about or descriptions of the mind and how it works in it. It was around then as I found his tools giving me help and leverage that nothing else could quite do. I mean, you have to, you have to treat it holistically, right? But, the, but I was seeing it, there was a distinct moment for me when I went from, oh, these are some strange books to this is telling me about how things actually work. Like I can see what's written here echoed in the way that my life is, is going. Um, so that's when it, not only I began to really see it as a source of really potent information, but it's also when I started to get really inspired to try to tell people about it because it's not something that comes easily getting that great value out of Swedenborg. Cause there's so, like you're saying, there's so much of it. It's hard to categorize. It can be confusing, but now that I know it can be so helpful, what I want to try to do is learn it. Like you're saying, gain all that knowledge about it so that I can distill it quickly and get people to understand. This is not gonna be for everyone, but there's gonna be plenty of people, and we're seeing this in the comments on the channel, to whom it is, it's helpful to them like it was helpful to me. So I'm trying to create an easy way for people to get access to those ideas that have helped me a lot. You know, it's funny, like you see, um, uh, like there's, there's almost like a cultural need, like uh, philosophical, uh, religious ideas have been so diminished and um 
just believe the science and don't believe in anything spiritual. This is all nonsense. And yet yeah. there's this huge gap so in culture, in humanity, where people are incredibly dissatisfied with their life. I experienced that. I used to live in Miami and I was in this stage where I was like, kind of what, what you're talking about, where you're just sort of like, you're, you're engaging in behaviors which do not make you happy. And like, and yet it was like not stoppable. It was just complete, yeah. no, I'm just going to keep doing this. And I was like, what am I doing? This is like, it was the same thing every day. And I was like, I am not happy. And I wonder like, um, is there um, like, sometimes I see like um, these guys on the streets, You'll, you've seen these guys and they've got their Bible out and they're in the park and they're yelling like, you know, repent. And, you know, I used to think people, I'm like, what, a moron, like what, an embarrassing idiot. And I remember the last, I haven't seen one for a year or so, but I remember the last time I saw one of those guys, I was like, oh, I totally get that now. I totally get it because what happens is, is once, once you've got a little piece of this puzzle and it's worked for you, like for you, like you, you did, you've, you figured something out and it seems like it's working. You're like, dude, I got this. I got to tell people about this. Right. Yeah. Right. Because yes, if something, if you had a point where you really needed help and something helped you there when, when nothing yeah. else could, you feel this, you feel tied to it. And you also feel this sense of urgency. Like, Wait a second everybody needs help and, and this is i've got to fix the world so i yeah, yeah you, you know people can do it in ways that are really abrasive and that, that i you know but 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 I, I certainly you could you could feel for someone who really thinks it's really about the intent right and swedenborg would always say this that it's not it's not as much about the action as it is about the intent so if that guy has that bible out there and he really thinks that i need this to be happy well, it's like good on him. You know, if he thinks he's really saving me, if, if the, the reverse of that would be, if, you know, you, you can have religious culture, that's just, I'm just trying to control you. And I like telling you that you have to think the same way that I do and that you'll suffer if you don't, then you're getting into the, the, the hell side of it because yeah. to Swedenborg, you know, you said it, you know, it's about consciousness is about what we love. And he, he had, he starts his book, divine love and wisdom by saying, uh, love is our life. People talk about love. And they use that word a lot, but nobody knows what it fundamentally is. And that actually what makes you alive is what you, what you care about above anything else. And heaven and hell are just two different primary loves that you can have. So hell is the love of and consequent enjoyment of harming or ruling over other people, right? In, in whatever way that is. And heaven is the love or consequent enjoyment of benefiting other people and one of the two ultimately ends up driving us and that's what so any action can be approached from either of those angles um, but ultimately yeah it comes down to what you love and what you care about and that's gotten lost in religion a lot of the time it's so so much becomes like hey i've got these certain ideas and if you agree with them and do these rituals then you're in i think that's part of why people the, their diminishment of the religion in Western culture has happened. And that was part of why I got into YouTube in the first place, because when I got onto YouTube at first, this was back in 2010, it was mostly dominated by atheists who were often from a Christian background who had an upbringing that they felt like was really negative and they were, uh, they didn't, they were poking holes in the rationality of their religion. And a lot of people were finding that, so there was that, and then there was a couple of fundamentalist Christians trying to poke back at that. But there was this whole missing middle of sophisticated, um, broad, open-minded religious discussion and and I or, or spiritual discussion or whatever you want to call it. Yep. And I thought, oh, Swedenborg can fit in there. You know, that's so cool. Now the, the funny thing is, a Swedenborg Christian mystic, but I mean his ideas would you know. Well, he was on trial, so he'd probably get tossed out of most churches. But yeah. he's he had a really unique um, idea about a lot of things. And um, yeah, I wonder, like, when I think of it, I've done like a lot of studying. I've had a lot of experiences, and that sort of forced me into studying a lot to try and understand what the hell has gone on. <laughs> um, and so that, like, that sort of uh, informed my uh, analysis 
about how to think about consciousness and how it's presented. Like, uh, so for example, like if I'm moving through like a zone of like dead people or whatever, like during like meditation, like thinking about, okay, where, where is this located in the uh, spiritual realms and trying to sort of get some kind of like geography of what's actually happening. But that was kind of like my, those are kind of like my influences, you might say, like like some of the stuff I've read. I wonder like what what kind of influence did, did Swedenborg was such a, an educated guy. Did he, uh, do you think he was influenced in his understandings of this by other writers? I mean, obviously he was influenced by the Bible somewhat, but yes. did he bring understanding? Like, for example, like, I'm not sure if this is true. I'm not sure if it's true, but you talk about just the spirit world, for example. And I tend to split that up into like different, like the astral and the mental plane and all this kind of stuff, which uh, I'm wondering, does, does Swedenberg go down that path? Did he study like Buddhist stuff too or nothing? It's just all personal experience. I think that he was definitely interest in influenced by classical thought. So he would... The, the style that he wrote in was called the geometric style and that could, that traces it back to ancient Greek thinkers. Uh, he talked about things that Aristotle talked about. He certainly, his, his way that he thought about ideas was influenced by that. I don't think he had a lot of um, study of Eastern religions. I don't think that that material was as readily available in the, the 1700s as it yeah. is now. Yeah, um, of course, yeah. And he, he does while he, yeah, he, he, when he started his spiritual experiences, he, he wasn't, he was religious before. I mean, he, he was a Christian before, but when he started having his experiences, he taught himself Greek and Hebrew so that he could start to really study the Bible. I don't, oh, he, did he did study, he did study the Kabbalah too, right? I believe he, I read that or I heard on one of your interviews or something. He has a lot of, um, similarities to Kabbalah, um, for example, that his concept of the grand human is where all of heaven, you can, all the different functions people can perform in heaven, which is all the people who are in the state of heaven working together, um, that reflects the human form. And there's something similar in Kabbalah, as far as I know, um, but I don't think there's any record of him actually diving into that he even says at one point that he wasn't he was forbidden somehow from studying other christian theologies too in depth because he he wasn't supposed to it was supposed to keep his mind a little bit of a blank slate to learn things from what he experienced now he definitely had when he started out a a preconception that was based on lutheran theology and you can actually see throughout his earliest writings and his like mature spiritual writings him change Th things like there's key points on what's the nature of the trinity what the nature of jesus is what's the nature of life after death you can see those things change as he's writing he had this idea that kind of went with the religion he's in but then he ends up in a place where he's he's redefined almost all the major points of Christian theology, because Lutheranism at the time was there's God who's the father and he's angry at the human race. And so Jesus, who's the son, they're the same God, but they're, you know, and so Jesus dies and now God's not angry. And he was adamant that there's not three different sorts of gods. There's God is like us. So we have a soul, a body, <laughs> and then the actions or the effects of your life. And he's to him that that was the, the Trinity, that Jesus is like the body of the unknowable God, which is like the soul. And then the actions that God performs to run life or what you could call the Holy Spirit. So we had that, he had heaven and hell being the state of mind. He talked about how as actually at his, the time when he was traveling, he saw it was easier for non-Christians to go to heaven than Christians because Christians had all these uh, ideas that they were becoming too adamant about that were steering them away from love, that, that love of your fellow human beings is the core component of religion. And the ideas are meant to be um, just filling that out. And so there's a lot of people that, a lot of spirits that he met from non-Christian areas of the world that he said were much, it's much easier for them to go into heaven because they didn't have all these pieces of resistance against it, which the Christian 
church that he was in did not like him saying that, but he, he was also, um, oh, there's so many, uh, the, the Bible, the Bible. He's talking about the Bible. He wrote his first eight volumes in Latin were going through the early stories of the Bible and talking about the inner meaning of them. So to him, well, yeah, the entire, can you yeah. explain, can you explain that how he did? It? I remember like trying to reach on that stuff. Like, so he actually reinterprets those first, um, those first books of the Bible. And there's like, yes. I remember back when I was reading Swedenborg, one of my viewers sent me a book called the cipher of Genesis, Genesis, which is not Swedenborg, but it's, yeah. uh, it's actually a, it's a different style of interpretation of the of genesis i guess too so it's another type but like so there was some kind of like symbolic understanding which he found in the bible which wasn't actually explicitly written down is that right yes so he said that the whole the bible is written in the same language that you dream in so there's a universal <laughs> there's there's a universal not language that he called the language of correspondences. And it is based out of the relationship between the spiritual and physical world. So um, for an example of a correspondence is light and truth correspond to each other. So truth is spiritual. That's something that can only occur inside mm -hmm. a mind so that's conscious. And light is physical. What light does in the physical world, the, the way that, for example, it allows you to see and navigate terrain it makes the growth of plants possible, right? The truth plays the same role in the spiritual or mental world. So truth, yeah. that's why we talk about our, our ideas being illuminated or, oh, I see when we understand something. So there are these correspondences where there's physical things that will play the same role that spiritual things do. So all, all the stuff that it's talking about in the Bible, it's all written in correspondences. So in the very beginning, when you when it's talking about the creation of the world and it starts out, being without form and void and ends up with a world that's populated by all kinds of things. That's talking about the development of your own spirit throughout the course of your life, because the earth corresponds to uh, the good things in you or the potential for good things. The plants and things that grow are the ideas and insights that you get as you go. The light is when we first get the understanding of truth. The humans appearing on the earth is when we come into a state of what true humanity is, which is love for your neighbor. So it's all, it's all symbolic. He said, he did say that some parts of the Bible happened. He doesn't, he says that the beginning part, the very beginning parts did not happen. The creation story, Noah's flood, some of it is, he, he believes historically accurate, but that history was recorded in a way that it's all purely symbolic. So it's not, it so the whole thing is about eternal stuff. So the whole thing is about yeah. universal processes that go in, on inside every person. And so this was something that he was painstakingly trying to describe, that he was saying, look, this is, the Bible is, is fundamentally misused. And he was saying that you can actually see this evidence of this language, particularly in the way Jesus acts, that Jesus is always telling you parables. He'll talk about, look, there's a, a sower was sowing seeds and some of the seeds grew and some of them didn't because they were rocks and stuff. And then the disciples are saying to him, well, what does that mean? And he says, well, the seed is like the, your mind. He's giving, it's that correspondences. And then later he's walking on the road to Emmaus with the disciples and they don't know it's him, but he, it says he opens up and shows how all the Old Testament or, or the Torah speaks of him. And even though he's not mentioned in there, it's because of this correspondence thing. So to Swedenborg, this was like, no, this is this is the way that the Bible was meant to be taken, and it's you, you can see it for yourself if you understand if you have sort of a, a couple of basic pieces of knowledge about how it's written. He says that it's the same language, right? That you would you would dream in that that when a house appears in your mind when you're dreaming, that that's a symbol of the the state of the human mind, just like all these endless descriptions in the Bible of how you build this one temple and how many columns it has to have and how many curtains it has to have as describing particular states of mind and processes that go on inside of you. So to him, it was all um, the, the literal meaning, the stories and things are a container that holds this spiritual meaning, um, all of which ultimately treats of the process of learning to love your neighbor 
that's why the, the, you have the two great commandments. And that's that's what is the value of the Bible. It's interesting. There's a, a an author, magical author called Franz Berdan, and he wrote a book called The Key to the True Kabbalah, which is a Western magical book essentially. But what it describes is something which is commonly talked of as the language of the gods. And what it does is basically it, so, it associates letters. Uh, it's it's a it's a sort of language of associating le letters with colors and sounds and vibrations, and then mm -hmm. combining them. Now, if you've ever like uh, watched any like mystical people meditating, they, they'll often meditate on a color or they'll meditate on yeah. on a vibrational state. And like in my experience, if you meditate on a, a, a vibrational state, that's an easy way to like evoke a spirit. Like if I go into if I'm meditating and I like. Uh, push myself into the state of like Krishna, like I'll evoke Krishna. And it's like a, an amazing experience. But in the key to the true Kabbalah, there's like a whole language of this, which is like, which uh, if if one is so inclined, you can like start, um, you can start like building, I don't know what you call it, like sort of uh, vibrational words together. So I saw, I was interested about like, about that from the angle about how, how Swedenborg did it. It seems he's actually working more from like a metaphorical level rather than the, I mean, I, listen, Swedenborg was so deep. He was probably working from a vibrational level and simplifying it to metaphors for the public to try and understand like what's actually happening. Now, my own experience is I've had like, I've had visions and stuff like, um, uh, yeah, of this kind of that kind of stuff. Like I can see this kind of thing. Like I get these, uh, these, um, downloads i guess you call them information um this is something this is something I'm, I'm interested in like you know i went through this experience of like the the whole kundalini awakening thing which is uh is unbelievable and it seems like it's like nonsense but it's actually true and i wonder because like different people experience kundalini awakening in different ways and that's sort of like a way of just saying a spiritual awakening uh, and it can take various different forms i think if you look at people like saint Teresa of avila who was the the uh, Christian mystic nun? I think she was, but she obviously she clearly went through some kind of like what I would think of as a Kundalini event, and then she was like she was having these massive experiences. She's got a book. What's her book called? The Mansions of God or something? But if you hmm. read that book, like for, if I read that book, holy wow! I mean, that like you can feel it. You can feel it just coming off the page. Like she was in like a deep place. Now, for me, I went through this sort. Of, I went through a bunch of these experiences where it was like a real, like the classic experience of the energy coming through, and you hear bells and waterfalls and everything, and then it blows out your crown chakra. But I don't think I think some people it happens in a much more sort of natural and soft way. You know, it happens in a soft way, and I'm interested, like, what, like, what was the point of transition for Swedenborg? Like he he obviously went through a stage. He was like, "Hey, I'm a scientist. I'm a politician." Oh, hold on, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> maybe I'm not, right? Yeah, you can you can read blow by blow what happened to him because he kept a record of it. So yeah. it's what book it, is that? That would that be cool to read. It's that, called um, Dream Diary or Journal of Dreams. It's sometimes Journal translated okay by Emanuel Swedenborg. Um, and that, that was, it's exactly what it sounds like. It was him keeping what was originally a travel journal and he started recording his dreams in it. And that was right around the time when everything blew open. And it started his dreams. It started his dreams. I was listening in your interview today and it was dreams and, um, dreams, the hypnagogic state that is like the jumping off place for astral projection. So like when you're in this state between a wakefulness and uh, and sleepiness and your body is very relaxed, that it seems for some people who are so inclined that you can enter into these stages. So that was it. It was through sleep. Well, so it started that way. He, he began to have he had these dreams and they began to get more and more vivid and more and more meaningful and, and starting to be full of correspondences. So for, for ex one example I like to give is there was a black dog that kept reappearing in his dreams and it would menace him or try to bite him. And he would not only write his dreams, but he would write, start to write his guesses at interpretations of them. And he was convinced that the black dog was a symbol of his pride because he was very successful in a lot of things. And so he thought that he was hot stuff and 
it was getting in the way of his spiritual awakening. And so he, those experiences started to get more and more intense. And then he, they began spilling over into wait, what he calls experiences in a state of full wakefulness. So that was when he began to have visions and out of body experiences. And, and there was a couple of powerful ones where he, where he first had spirits start to talk to him. He had an encounter where he says that he met Jesus Christ and that had a really powerful expect effect on him. And he came out the other side in a state in which he described interacting with the spiritual world like all day, every day for, for the next 30 years. And so it would be in all, in all kinds of states. So there'd be times when he would be, for example, he would be writing and he'd be able to see a colored flame that would change colors based on whether what he was writing was true or not. He would hear spirits commenting on his work. Then he would also have, be able to see simultaneously physical people and spiritual people at the same time and, and converse with each. There'd be times when he totally left his body and was traveling through the spiritual world. Often he would say, you know, I was meditating on a particular concept. So I was meditating on the state of marriage in the golden age or the, one of the ancient ages of, and from that an angel or some being would approach him and say, Hey, we, we heard you're meditating on this. Do you want to go check it out? And then he record his experiences there. Um, so he, he had, there's, he said just a couple times he was actually, he said, just to be shown what it was like, he said that he was walking through a city in, in the physical regular world and went and started having a spiritual experience. And when he came back to his body, he's on the other side of the city. So somehow he, he could just keep on autopilot moving through. He had something very close to, a a near death experience as it would be described. Now he wasn't in any kind of physical danger, but he said he was shown the dying process. That's actually our channel's name off the left. eye comes out of that experience a, in a, during a part of it. He says he, there's a correspondence of a covering being rolled off of his left eye, which is the, uh, the eye that's a side that's associated with your understanding. And that was how he gained, gained the use of spiritual sight. So he did a ton of stuff like that and, and eventually ended up, where he was constantly in the company of the spiritual world. And uh, another thing you might be interested in reading is there's the Journal of Dreams, which I told you about, but there's also his Journal of Spiritual Experiences. And the Journal of Dreams is over a couple months, but the Journal of Spiritual Experiences is over many, many years. And it's the raw material from which a lot of his books came. This is him just describing in, in entry form, you know, the, the you know, June of 1758, this is what happened to me. He describes what it felt like. He describes what kind of spirits he talks to, what effect they had on him, where he was in the spiritual world. It's this real treasure trove of, like, yeah, as I said, raw, raw data behind or, or raw description of what it was like to be able to, like you're describing, having these spiritual experiences and trying to figure out where are you in that world? And he was really interested in, yeah, interested in like, what, how does the other world work? Because he was, he was a scientist. So he's knowing how this world works. So in his book, Heaven and Hell, for example, he'll have, he'll have a chapter on how the four directions work in the afterlife, how time and space work in the afterlife. Yeah. So there's, he's not just, it's not just the experiences and the stories, but he's getting at the mechanics of how the thing is put together. So the four directions, I remember just, I remember listening to you recently, and apparently the, it was the East is associated with wisdom. And it's interesting because in a lot of magical, uh, and I'm not a magician at all, but there's like a lot, in a lot of magical circles, like they they envision the, uh, the points of the compass, and then you'll have like the Raphael on one side and Gabriel on the other side and Aurel on the other side and Raphael, Gabriel, so I can't remember the other one, but there's yeah. like, but but each one is associated with one of these qualities. It's, this is the really fascinating thing about it because you you can read like because I went through a stage of like when I was trying to understand this stuff of reading like all the magical books, all the all the Buddhist books, as much as I could, and then you know until you've had the experience, it just seems like a bunch of words like oh yeah okay wisdoms in the east sure thing yeah <laughs> right whatever dude what does but that even really, mean yeah. Yeah, but it's so interesting because he's obviously like Swedenborg was like 
what decades of like being in the spiritual world and he's he's having these experiences which are like in some ways correspond with like lots of other traditions although this is the interesting thing though is because like his experience is clearly quite is sort of based on the sort of imagery and metaphors of, of christianity right so he's seeing god and jesus and um and like most of my experiences were based on like what you might call the hindu pantheon so a lot of experiences with krishna and um shiva and this kind of stuff and it all seems like like oh one's one's right and one's wrong some people might think that way um but um you know i don't know i wonder i wonder i wonder about 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 that just like uh i think some people i had a big experience this last year um i was working with a, a guy uh, this guy christer who i did an interview with and christer's uh he's like an enlightened he's enlightened he's an enlightened guru guy young guy but he's been enlightened and I was working with them and we did a, we did a, we've done a whole series of meditations together. And after one of the meditations, and I've been in this, this sort of spiritual world of experience for some time, you know, I yeah. went through this phase of seeing demons and spirits, angels. Um, and then um, I, you know, I'm like, I, I don't understand it all, but I think I've got this down. Okay. It's, this is crazy. I'm just gonna have to learn to deal with this. I'm gonna have to like learn a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, yeah. after one of these meditations, I was driving home and I was like, it was actually the first meditation. I, you know, you do a meditation with somebody, you think, eh, what, whatever, dude, that was nonsense, right? And I got in the car and I'm driving home and all of a sudden something happened, which I can't really describe. It's just like I was looking up over the bay because there's a little there's a hill here and you can see the ocean. And I was looking around and driving down and I saw this cloud and I looked at the cloud and all of a sudden there was a sense of knowing, of knowingness. And this knowingness just expanded out into infinity. And it was like complete, well, it, it felt like enlightenment. It felt like enlightenment. And then it, and then I was there for about 30 minutes and then it went away. But what the, the big lesson from this was like, dude, like everything I thought I knew about the spirit world is not, is not um, absolutely true. So the thing hmm. that I just saw, that moment of enlightenment is very different from the spirit world. And the only, the, and the moment of enlightenment, the only thing, what I said is, I, at the time I said, you know, if a Christian saw this, they'd think it was Christ. Because it was just, it was, it's just so astonishing. It's just, I'm never, it's just, and it, I guess it conforms to what like people like Eckhart Tolle would call like the now, the now moment, the now moment. But I wonder, cause like, I'm getting back to Swedenborg here, is like, cause Swedenborg was in this, in the spirit world but like for me there was this moment of like clarity but swedenberg swedenberg seems to be moving into this space like from a like on a curve maybe he started off slowly in the dream world and started moving up into these more conscious experiences and i'm wondering when did the uh like what was his experiences with did he have did he have like what am i trying to say what was his experience with god or like this infinite radiance like for me it just seemed like infinite radiance i i swear to god like at that moment that was that changed it changed my life i think that moment it's like you suddenly realize that god is real and it's not anything you thought about it's not a thought structure it's not it's just it's beyond all conception and i'm wondering like swedenborg obviously is is profoundly deep in this spiritual space did he have did he did what was what would you is there a space in his story which seems like it's like at the absolute zenith of his experience? Like, where does he describe that? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I know, well, the, I mean, the encounter with Jesus was a turning point for him. I, he seems to describe the sort of ineffable stuff that you're talking about a lot he'll often in his works he'll be describing principles that you can follow and then he'll say but how this next thing works is way too complicated i i couldn't explain it yeah. to you yeah, and yeah, yeah. and i couldn't explain it to you in in physical he says that there's two parts of our minds that we have an 
earthly level to our minds and a spiritual level to our minds. And that when we're in the earthly level of our mind, we can't really grasp or articulate deeper spiritual things that he would have experiences where he would be among spirits and angels and they would be teaching him these really deep things and he would get it then but when he came back uh to, you know to be at his desk on earth and trying to write it he, he couldn't understand anymore <laughs> what they were talking about and it was frustrating so i i i know that he for the amount that he wrote though um it's a little harder to pick out because everything he would write was in this, you know, matter of fact, detached kind of style. So it's a little harder to pick out what really hit him. I definitely in his journal of dreams, he's having these moments where he's realizing his total dependence on God. And he described when, when he sits down and describes what God is, he, he says that there are layers upon layers to it that you you can't even not even the highest angels could possibly grasp yeah. like you know yeah. it's way it's way beyond and as far as he says it that angels recognize and that we should be all recognizing that it, it is it, this is a direct quote it is wisdom to admit that what we know is nothing compared to what we don't know yeah and met, and even that yeah sorry one, one last thing on that is that yep. he was a very intellectual guy yeah. Right. That that was what he did. And I think one of the most shocking discoveries to him was that um, really there's two parts of a human being, according to him, there's the intellect and the will, right? So there are the thoughts and then there's the, the feeling or the experience. And that he was very surprised to learn that actually the thing that really drives everything is, is the will or the, the emotive, the, the yeah. intellect plays a supporting role. And this was a real revelation to him because I think before that he thought it was all the other way around. So it's act that there there's more wisdom in in love than there is in in a bunch of intellectual concepts. So I, I think if you're talking about that, is he you know bumping up against stuff that's outside of his ability to explain or categorize all the time, all the time. And I think that. Well, I, I know I said one last thing, but then one little sticky note on the end of it here is that I think that things do fall into the structures that we have when he describes how dreams happen. And he says that dreams can be based on conversations that are happening around us in the spiritual world, but between spirits, but those or between angels, but those concepts appear to us in the things in our memory that correspond to that. So like a really tangible example that he gives is that there was a, he says there was a conversation happening between two angels about a certain kind of superficial state of mind that people can be in. And so Swedenborg was dreaming at the time. And in his dream, a person that he, he believed to have that state of mind appeared in his dream and was part of it. So the, the conversations there can, or the, the, the sort of, underlying essence of what the dream is about would appear differently are we like we could he be near the same conversation in the spiritual world but i would have a different dream than you would because i have different things and associations in my memory with it it's interesting you're talking about the intellect and the will this is something i've worked a lot with because like there's um like uh i hate to i hate to move into chakra territory but like when people discuss the chakras the first four chakras uh, have like what they call um, elemental associations. So you'd get earth, water, fire, and air, uh, which are all fire and air are also associated with the intellect and the will. And he was a great intellect. And so what happens is a lot of times, uh, this is just from like people I've talked to and from my own experiences, um, like uh, people have pre uh, existing predilections. Uh, what, you know, for his was obviously the intellect. And I've seen several like, several stories of intellectuals have sort of broken into like sort of enlightenment territory or spiritual territory because the force of their intellect is just so powerful that it just seems to like somehow shatter shatter that area um hmm. and then the um my own my own uh, uh pre-election was the water element which is astral which is sort of the imagination I was one of those kids in school where I'd be sitting there like not listening to like not listening to the teacher. I'd be off like dreaming about something like doing yes. something more fun, you know? And um, 
so it's funny that he was coming up against this, uh, uh, or he, he was coming to these realizations because even if people don't have the, the, even if we use different languages to describe this stuff, I'm talking about the chakras. He obviously wouldn't talk about the chakras, but he's talking about the same, the same relationship. One of the big things, like like I was saying in that uh, that thing about seeing demons and stuff, was like during I was like two years, I was having like some really crazy experiences, and it was like, why is this happening? What is going on? Why is this? And in one of those books I was reading, Franz Verdun, he mentioned that uh, elemental balance is the ability to balance the desire with the will, with the intellect, and to try and sort and sort of consciously, consciously find your space in consciousness. I think part of the problem is that we're really illiterate with consciousness, like humans. We just we don't have a language. We don't have a meta language yeah. to understand. What the hell is going on? And then, you know, the cool thing is if you find something like Swedenborg, I think a lot of times, like a lot of the, like the traditional, this um, traditions, the traditional traditions, there you go. The disciplines <laughs> like Christianity or Buddhism, like yeah. in some way they, they, what they do is they provide a sort of simplified language. Cause like being, having like a meta language for consciousness, that's, that's probably, you know, it's too advanced for the Netflix crowd, probably. But, you know, if you can just sort of follow some sort of basic understandings, maybe it'll be OK, you know. Um, right. um, I wonder, like like Swedenborg, in one of your your videos, you were mentioned that he I think it was your video. He didn't want to create a church. Right. So he yes. wasn't interested really in like what was his I mean, he was having these experiences and what was his way of like. Because like, look at you, you felt the power of this and you're trying to teach people. What, the, what did Swedenborg do other than write yeah. Latin? Right? Yeah, that, that, that was, so he, he definitely didn't seem to be trying to gain uh, attention or adulation or religious control through it. Because he didn't, all he ever did was he wrote these books and he was, reacting and trying to figure out what's the right book to write to get people to pay attention to this. For example, his book, Heaven and Hell, which ended up being his most popular book, that was only written after his explanation of the Bible. Nobody was really paying attention to it. And and people, originally he was writing anonymously, so he wasn't putting his name on any of the books. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that, but, but people started to suspect that maybe it was him and eventually they found out that he was having these spiritual experiences. So that everyone wanted to know about afterlife and things. So he would write out heaven and hell and to give people explanations of that, but he would have all these footnotes leading back into his earlier work. So he felt like this is really important for you guys to get this. Um, and he did, yeah, he didn't, he, he wasn't trying to start a church. I think he was trying to reform the church of his day. I think he, he felt like, oh, there's, there can be value in this, but there's a lot of stuff that's really gotten stripped of its, its love and its value. Um, and he he saw religions of all kinds over all over the world as being good functional mechanisms for getting people into the state of mind called heaven. That he said, it, you 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 become regenerated or or enlightened through what he calls conscience, which is your sense of what's right and wrong that you gain through your religious or spiritual teachings. So more important than what beliefs you have, it's which of those beliefs do you take to be true and do you act on the ones that you you think are true? So, and do you have some kind of acknowledgement of a being that's greater than yourself? Those are the only ingredients you need for the divine to lead you into enlightenment or in, into heaven. So he, I don't think he was felt like it was necessary to dismantle. He tried to dismantle some of what he felt like was harmful about Christianity, but to him, a lot of the religions around the world were doing what they're supposed to do. But he was trying to introduce a la really a language of consciousness, a, a, much, a much more focused and clear understanding of the big picture that humanity had sort of checked out of. I mean, there's bits and pieces of it all over. He talked about the correspondences that he, he said, the correspondences that I was talking about before, that was the basis of Egyptian hieroglyphics. That's that's why you had, like with the, the direction of the East, I mean, that's why so many indigenous religions all around the world would have particular parts of nature or groves or hills that they'd worship on because the original revelation was nature 
that yeah. nature is correspondences as well. And in, back before there needed to be a written revelation, like a, a Bible, people could just read it right out of nature. And that's why they, all of the ceremonies and things were based around n animals and plants and, and like the mountains and landscapes and the ocean. And that was the original revelation, but people lost the ability because self-centeredness and materialism crept in people lost the ability to read that that's when it became necessary for there to be religious texts and what he said the soul of what he says the bible is right now has existed in other texts before he talks about something called the ancient word that was prior to this one before that it was in nature so it's a continuation of the divine trying to make sure that there are these tools that keep heaven and earth connected um, but but that connection can happen really effectively in all kinds of religious traditions. So he didn't need to try to erase those or or make a new one. I was interviewing this guy, uh, Jason Giorgiani, a few months ago. He's an author, controversial author, but he's, he's got a book called Prometheus and Atlas, which is like powerhouse intellectual analysis. But one of the interesting things about that book is of the um, of our current state of affairs in the world, I guess. One of the things he mentions in the book is he mentions uh, Swedenborg and he mentions Swedenborg in context because uh, Georgiani is a philosopher and his whole his whole thesis about our current our current uh, world is that with the influx of technology into our world that technology in some ways represents dangers to humanity right there's some kind of danger here for example with artificial intelligence and all this stuff and he traces this back to like Swedenborg and he traces it back because Swedenborg was so influential. And then at the same time, uh, like Rene Descartes and Immanuel Kant both wrote stuff about Swedenborg and they both, they both basically um, denied the validity of Swedenborg's work. You know, I mean, Descartes famous right. for saying like, uh, I think therefore I am actually placing the, uh, the, the sort of focus of consciousness in the thought, right? But Immanuel Kant also did a, he wrote a short pamphlet, like completely like uh, blowing Swedenborg off, but amazingly he had all of Swedenborg's book in his library and he studied them extensively. And so what, what Georgeni says is like, there's almost a fear. There's almost like a fear of the, of, of the truth of God or the spirit. And, you know, I wonder, cause you know, like, I mean, our world is, dude, it's so crazy. And like, I've gone through my own, like, I, I daily, as you know, you get the, the thoughts in your mind and you look at society and you look at the, the sort of libertine disintegration and many, in some aspects, there's obviously some great things going on too, but like, um, I've got, I've got three kids and like my son is 12 years old and you know, he's starting to like girls and stuff. And dude, I was thinking that I was thinking originally, like, dude, he's gonna, he's going to discover porn. I'm like, I've got yeah. to like, but but you know what? But that is like a that is like a, I call these this desire stations. Like what Swedenborg talks about about how people dive into hell. In one of my first ayahuasca ceremonies, I was flying through some space, like I don't know what this is, and I saw like like a a, a portal. Which seemed very attractive, and I, I was looking in there, all these beautiful women, and I'm like, oh, I like this. I'm, I'm going in, right? And this is people dive into hell. Anyway, I put one foot in, and I could feel evil. Mm. I could just feel it, and I'm like, get me out of here, man. Now that's like an ayahuasca experience of like a what I call a desire station, and there was thousands of them. They're just waiting for because there's thousands of desires. Right. But they exist in the real world too, right? They exist. Yeah. And you know, I don't want to seem like dude, I like drinking beer. I've done I've done everything wrong you can do in this world. I've done it, you know. Um yeah. And it's there for everybody. They're desire stations today. And I guess I, I just worry about it because like how do you I mean, maybe it's not my business, you know, to try and help people to just like because like this. This uh, influence of evil spirits, you talk yeah. about this, it's subtle. Would you call it subtle, the influence of evil spirits? Oh, well, uh, absolutely. And main, the main way it's subtle is that you don't know that that's what it is. I think that you, you talk about uh, we don't have a language of consciousness. We don't, And we don't have a language about desire. 
We don't yeah. have a language. We don't really investigate to Swedenborg. It, what, what you, what you get pleasure out of, that's the most important thing, but we never really think or talk about it. That, that, um, there are these that, that evil has a pleasure with it. Goodness has a pleasure with it. And it's about choosing those sorts of things. And absolutely Swedenborg talked about there's hell is always pressing because hell is made up of people who have devoted their life to some kind of harmful pleasure. And they are yeah. constantly trying to get you to experience that because then they can experience it with you. But they also are trying to destroy you because they yeah. know the more that you get into the same, the stuff there and the more that's going to destroy your ability to experience the good pleasures. And that's, that's what e evil gets its own pleasure out of that, uh, of destroying you. So it's absolutely the, the, the aim of hell all the time to try to mislead you and the aim of heaven all the time is to try to, he's talk, Swedenborg talks about angels that are with us and that they're always focused on what our goals are and trying to steer us toward better and better goals. And that the main spiritual work that we can do is be aware of what we enjoy. And once in a while, look at that. And I know you're saying, you, know, you don't want to judge people or get religious. So it's not, it's never for me to know what's going on with you. He says, you can't ever know the spiritual state of somebody else. But for each of us individually, we can look in and like with our conscience, like I was talking about before, we can look and say, what here out of my own free will, not because somebody else is telling me I have to do it. What here do I think that I have a tendency to enjoy and want to do, do I think that's not actually, I don't want to be doing that. Like you're saying, get me out of here. Like I, that, I don't think that that's, that that's a good thing to do. Then it's about asking for divine help to try to get us free from the desire and the, the drive to do that. And that throughout our lives, God is actually taking our spirit, which is right now can be in a community of heaven or hell. Like our spirit is somewhere just like our body is somewhere. So your spirit can be influenced by and actually moves around during your life based on what you're loving and, and doing. But if you're doing the spiritual growth work, it can actually be moved more and more into these communities of heaven. And with that comes these, these more and more constructive and loving and less destructive feelings and urges. And it's a slow process and it's not a super precise process. The Swedenborg says like, yeah, if, if you set yourself on a path towards doing what's right, but you make a mistake and you do the thing you didn't want to do, that's fine. It wasn't your overall intent. So it's not this, like, we're not splitting hairs. It's about what, what's your goal overall. Yeah. Um, you know, I saw in one of your, your uh, chats, you were saying that in the spirit world, there's no time. And I think that's one of the problems is that people think like, in you know, you can do something you can do something wrong, let's say. You can engage in the evil or whatever in your daily life. You're like, oh, whatever. The next day you forget about it. And you're like, I'm the, I'll have a shower. I feel better, you know. But the problem is, like, like what happens is these, like, um, like those those moments, like in a timeless environment, they extrapolate out into infinity. So what I think that's what I think that's what hell is is like. It's it's a wrong choice extrapolated out into infinity. That's why it seems like it's it's like forever. So it's this bad yeah. decision you made. And because there's no time when you die, that just boom. Um, I'm interested, like you were just saying there about uh, asking God for help. Like, cause I think a lot of people come to these like um, points in your life where you're like, dude, I got to change, right? I, gotta, yeah. I can't be drinking scotch until four in the morning. I got to do something different, right? What, yeah. what can I do? And you know, like, it's like, uh, like, uh, uh, have you have you uh what's your experience with prayer in this like for me i'll just tell you like for me like i was i didn't like using the word god i didn't like to say it i would never have prayed and a couple of years yeah. ago I, I some guy was saying dude try prayer and i tried prayer and it did my whole life disintegrated instantly all the bad things just oh it was crazy uh divorce everything but it was actually for the good it was a good process and i was like mm. this prayer stuff works and yeah. um but have you tried like applying that like on like, like, cause I mean, most of the evil I, or evil, it's evil is a strong word. Just the bad ideas yeah. you have. Like, do you, do you use prayer on like a, on like um, a granular, granular level, like on your daily life? Yes. So, so Swedenborg def defines prayer as speech with God at, at one point. So I don't do a lot of, 
formal, like, okay, I got to fold my hands and I've got to say some particular passage in scripture. But I, and I, but there'll be plenty of times when I'll be saying like, all right, can I have some help with this? And, or, or when I'll have asks and things. Um, yeah. And there's definitely when, when I get into a, a tough spot, like when I'm afraid and I feel like stuff is encroaching on me of whatever kind, I will, there'll be times when I will, I will repeat things like 23rd Psalm. I will repeat that. And I actually got that from, there was a guy who worked with schizophrenics in prison and in emergency rooms. And he, he had found through working with them that, oh, this, like the world, the, the demons they're describing in their heads are just like the ones Swedenborg are describing. And he had found that one of the best things you can do is just keep repeating 23rd Psalm so that you don't get um, sucked into the kind of reasoning that's there. So also when I'm scared, I'll do that. Um, Incredibly, yeah. It, it be, it be, and it's kind of like a mantra, you know, it calms you, but it's also like that, the 23rd Psalm, and we did which a show one is about, the 23rd, which one is so that? It's the, 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 the Lord is my shepherd, uh, okay. I shall not want. So it's like probably the most famous Psalm, or one of the more famous parts of the Bible. And so um, there, the correspondential meaning of that is all about, you know, God's taking care of it. And yeah. I, I think that um, so I will use it sometimes, but it's not like I wouldn't probably seem super religious in the way that I do it day to day. I think it's more like it's more about what, whatever feels genuine to you. So I will. Yeah, there's sometimes I'll use a, a, a micro level of it. A lot of the times, though, what I'll do is return to particular concepts from Swedenborg. So if, if, he, if for example, I get some thought in my mind that's trying to make me worry about some outcome like th this what if this bad thing happens i can probably what i would try to do is i would either quote or remember something about well god doesn't allow anything to happen except if ultimately good can be brought out of it or another thing that swedenborg says is that um i don't know what i need that your mind will try to get you worried about well, you're not going to get this kind of acceptance or recognition, or you're not going to get this opportunity. And if you don't have a principle to, to prop yourself up against that, you know, what I would used to do is be like, well, maybe I will, I'll try really hard to do this. And that could just, they'll just get you more and more worried about it. But if I say the, the, the axiom that I don't, I don't know what I need, I don't know what's best for me. This is something that only the divine knows. And, the, and what I'd rather have is a divine lead me wherever we've got to go because the divine loves you and it wants to do good to you. So if I say that, it's sort of like, you know, that like thing on the playground, I I'm rubber, you're glue. Like you just repeat something <clears throat> if it diffuses it to me, those, those little ideas, like, and you can find whichever ones work for you, but I don't know what I need. <clears throat> Another one that I'll say is when my, um, so I had a grandfather who I'd never got to meet because he died before I was born, but I'm, I'm, my middle name is after him and he was dying. And as he was dying, he couldn't speak anymore. He had, to, he could only write because of the, the condition that he was having. And he, um, he was into Swedenborg. He, he was, he actually had been originally from Sweden and then moved to Estonia and then came to the United States. And so he was had, had read a lot of Swedenborg and everything. And as so my grandmother was worried and saying, well, what's going to happen to you? Do you think you'll die soon? Or, and he wrote, um, I hope the Lord will use me as his best for everyone. Hmm. And I, that there is such diffusing power in that because when my worries will come to me and they'll try to get you like, what, you know, are you, is your life going to go in the way you want it to to have you done the right or wrong thing? Well, are you going to get this opportunity or not get it? If I say I could try to defend myself, or if I say, well, I hope that the divine is going to use me as his best for everyone. There's an invincibility in that because it shows that you trust this higher power. It also shows that what's, what is, what ruling love is that reflecting? What that's because what, what hell will try to make your, your 
sense of your own importance nervous. But if you say, well, I, I God's in charge, I hope that, and, and what I hope happens is that I'm used in a way that's best for everyone, that's, hell's got no power over that. It can't, you can't worry when what you care about is doing the best for everyone. So little things like that, uh, axioms that have a lot of meaning to me, I find repeating those and having those at hand can really diffuse situations that would spiral otherwise. I think, you know, it's easy to talk about like evil spirits and demons, but actually like just it's the, the pervasive, the pervasive form of this, whatever it is, is just simple thoughts. Like the thought structure. Right. So whenever you see like, whenever you see complex thought structures emerging, that's almost a sign. Like, cause what, what you're, what you're saying is just actually have faith in the process. It's all good. Right. Right? right. So it's actually not engaging. It's not engaging in. Well, it's not engaging in the science. I'm about anti-science. It's not engaging in the science of thoughts. It's letting it go. It's letting it yeah. go. And, you know, it's funny, you know, it's like. It's almost like uh, a thea. I, I'm almost at the place in my life where I would I would like a like a, a, thea, a theologically based society. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes it just makes more sense it's more yeah. it's actually what's going on like at some right. kind of level right yep yep you, yeah. do you feel that do you feel that I mean, is that I, mean, cause... I yeah i like building i like building a <clears throat> theologically based society in myself like when yeah. when i'm <laughs> i i love when i i go in and out of how um like theologically focused i am and it usually has to do with how much hardship is in my life. When there's a lot of hardship, I will really be rigidly focused on spiritual teachings and returning to that and, and asking for help. And, 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 and when things are going well, I kind of relax and I'm like, well, yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that <laughs> stuff. It's just human nature, right? Yeah. Um, so, and actually Swedenborg says that that's, that's part of the spiritual growth process is it's when we're in our times of hardship and what he calls spiritual crises. That that's when the most important leaps of growth happen. But uh, when I'm when I'm really in a mode where I'm really focusing on, I'm going to wake up and read some Swedenborg. Then I'm throughout the day, I'm going to think like this. I'm going to try to put um, charity or caring or love of the neighbor into every action I do and and apply these. I, I love that. I love yeah. how that feels. And and I I feel like I'd love to get to the point. I think I'm inching along toward it, but I'd love to get to the point where I am in that mode more often than not. And, and that's sort of when you say like a, the, yes, like a, a theologically based life, it just, what, what that would have sound, you know, when I was 16, if you had said that to me, I'd be like, oh, right. that sounds like the dumbest thing, oh. the corn, corniest, most religious thing. But now that I, I see what it all actually is, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. They, they just like, it's, it's like to get in that space and, and live in it. I've even imagined like when I'll walk through, uh, there's some cathedrals and things around here. And when I'm walking through, I'm like, I wish I just like was a monk in here. And all I did was like, think about spiritual things all day, which is not real. I mean, actual spirituality is like getting out and, and doing things to, to make life better for everyone. But there's a part of me that's like, I just want to live in the concept. Yeah. So I can totally feel you on that. Yeah. Where do you live? I'm in Bryn Athen in Pennsylvania, which is where we're oh, okay. just a, a stone's throw from Philadelphia. It's actually a borough that was founded by Swedenborgians like a hundred years ago. So you got the cathedral that's across the street is designed based on his concepts of correspondences. Oh. Um, yeah. There, there's like, so there's, it's kind of like a little Swedenborg theme park around sort of, I mean, there's like, <laughs> like there's some, it's like a, it's a like a national historic district over there, but there's a lot of sort of meaning in the way the buildings were constructed and stuff. So uh, there's a, there's a, I'm on the campus of a college that teaches Swedenborg courses. There's a, a really? library with some of his stuff. Yeah. So I get a lot of good networking there to, so to totally, help yeah. build content. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, yeah, so um, it's, it's just like, it's cool to have that reminder because it's, you can't really be spiritual in a vacuum. You've got to have people to bounce ideas off of and you've right. got to, You've got to have, you know, come, you, like we're having this conversation here. Uh, both of our concepts are deepening right now. You know, as we yeah. hear each other's perspectives on it, it's becoming more real and more alive. So it's good. Yeah. Last question. Um, you know, Swedenborg, he had all these, all these like uh, amazing spiritual experiences and uh, he left his body and everything. Um, 
and you know you've got a vibe like you're like you know you want to live this you want to live this life and like there's this like and like living in this sort of good place which is something i'm just getting into like i've i've been such a self-centered egoist for most of my life and all of a sudden it's like i'm trying to like dude you you have to like and it feels so good to give stuff back but i wonder like like for you do, do you ever like think um wow you know i'd like to have some of those experiences you ever try some astral projection or anything yourself or you just leave that for sweet yeah focus on the intellect side i i've certainly there have been plenty of times when i've really wanted to have them um i i haven't really had i haven't pursued it very hard um and i'm not like on the like meditation side i'm just not good at it like i know you were describing in your other video that you used to sort of think how can i meditate i can't and then it popped open for you i just it's so hard for me to um get my mind to slow down at all right but so so that so and and i i'm happy enough with where things are that i'm like okay well i think i'm there's something cool about that i haven't had those experiences i think it makes it um because because i talk on youtube about swedenborg stuff and it kind of because not everybody's had those experiences so i think it might make me more relatable to to them because i'm just having to kind of learn about it through other people than them but i was doing another um an interview on another guy's channel who uh was you know based around psychedelics and he was asking like why have you tried those and and are you uh, wanting to do that and i haven't done that and i the reason i haven't pursued that more is um i just feel like with with my like the depression anxiety all that like i've had this unstable mind and i've just kind of got things into some order and i'm like yeah. i don't want to mess with it i don't want to mess with the equilibrium because yeah. i'm worried i used to even like um you know even with with um less potent thing marijuana like i used to just get like start to get really stressed out and like oh this is i don't like this i don't like interrupting my reality <laughs> and so so i'm just worried like uh, you know like there's i i need my little world to be orderly right now um so i but i i think it's a good role that i can play you know i can be here yeah. and i can be this guy that that's you know just reading these books i hope to someday have visions and things i think that would be fun but i don't know i don't, like i said i don't know what i need i don't know yeah. if that would make good, it uh... like is would it be, would it, would it make things worse or better? I don't know. Yeah. So we'll, we'll let it happen. And in the meantime, I owe a lot of a, a debt of gratitude to people who have had those experiences. Cause not just Swedenborg, but I read, um, you know, all the major near death experience books and that had a huge impact on me. I love hearing about people's experiences and that fills things in for me. So, um, lo- you know, and, and I can live vicariously through, through you yeah. and all the yeah. other people who do it. And, and in the meantime, hopefully return the service of, taking the time to really delve deeply into one particular area and make that accessible for people. Yeah. Well, I think you're, like I said, your channel is awesome, man. Like it's just so, it's so wide open. It's like really easy to get into that channel. And it's funny because I, I, I watched it years ago and I got into it for a bit and then, you know, you know, YouTube is, you end up on somewhere else and then you go on yeah, different, right. different thing. Now you was just watching it again originally. I'm like, I remember, I remember why I like this, man. So it's really good. It's nice to talk to you, man. This has really been valuable uh, for me to chat to you. And uh, hopefully for other people too, because you're like, I think Swedenborg's got a lot of like valuable uh, insights and maybe people listening from my world might be intrigued to go listen to that, you know? Because a lot of people who do psychedelics think that spirituality is like, they do drugs, but they think that spirituality is bullshit, you know? (laughs) Which is the crazy (laughs) thing, you know? Right, right. But there's a crossover point. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it just seems like everybody that, gets into non-physical spaces ends up interacting with things that that are similar at some time to what Swedenborg saw so I think yeah not every part of it but I bet your viewers could find something that they like in there and um I really appreciate getting a chance to to meet you more and and talk to you here and I I love getting to hear about your how how you're an earnest student of what's out there you know and trying to figure it out and and I really appreciate what you're learning and that you're willing to, to share it with the world. Yeah. Thanks, bro. Um, nice chatting with you. Yeah. And have yeah, a great you... day. Keep, thank you. Keep, keep up your great channel, man. Will do. Peace brother. Talk to you. See ya. Bye-bye. Let me just kill this. Great.
they work. Whoop.